Let's now consider a reversible reaction that reaches equilibrium very quickly. So I'll remind you that our uh, reaction of interest is the simple reaction of A going to B uh, with forward rate constant of K1 and reverse rate constant of K minus 1. So the equilibrium constant for this process would simply be given by the ratio of those two rate constants. And you can also write it in terms of the uh, concentrations of the reactants uh, B divided by A. Now, we're going to have a state in which this is a very fast equilibrium, which means that no matter uh, how careful we mix these things together, they're going to be at equilibrium in a snap. So we're going to assume that our starting condition is actually an equilibrium condition at some temperature T1. All right, now what we want to do, though, is we want to find a way to suddenly change the temperature to a new temperature T2, and we'll say, for example, that that second temperature will be T1 plus 5K. Now that may not seem like a very big temperature difference, but we know from our thermodynamic studies that in fact um, the equilibrium constant can be very sensitive to the temperature. So this will be sufficient enough to change the value of the equilibrium constant. So in effect what we're doing is we're moving from one equilibrium state here to a second equilibrium state here, but we're making the temperature change very sudden so that we actually have the opportunity to watch the system relax between those two equilibrium states. Okay, so let's set up some ground rules or some ground line uh, for doing this. First of all, I should mention that this is a technique called temperature jump, and it usually can be done by applying a high voltage across uh, a solution, and that will raise the temperature very quickly within a microsecond or so uh, by five Kelvin. So uh, this is a, a great tool to use uh, if you're careful with electricity. All right, so let's uh, first of all write down our equations for what our state looks like at T1, and then we'll move over and see what it would look like at T2 when we reach equilibrium there. So at T1, um, we'll say that our concentrations are equal to little a1 and little b1. Okay, so I'm just using these to simplify my notation a little bit. I hope you'll allow me uh, not to have to keep writing these square brackets for concentration. Okay, at T2, I will have the following. I'll have that um, the concentration of A will be A2, the concentration of B will be B2, um, and these are, uh, you'll notice that the subscripts here all refer to the temperature that we're at. So that's a clue that when you see the subscript, it's telling you what temperature this state is at. But once these things are at equilibrium, these are all constants. So these are not things that are going to vary. What will vary is the change as we go from this value of A, a to this value of A for the concentration. As that's changing, we'll be uh, using a change variable x to denote that change. Okay, so what should we expect? Well, it depends on the change of enthalpy for this reaction. So let's say that this is an exothermic reaction. We could also do this for an endothermic reaction, but exothermic works just as well. Whenever we have an exothermic reaction, if we raise the temperature, this actually favors the reactants. And I want you to go back and review module three if you don't remember that, but uh, What's going to happen when we jolt something out of equilibrium is that to restore equilibrium, it'll go to the side, if we raise the temperature, it'll go to the side that has a higher enthalpy content, which in the case of an exothermic reaction is the reactant side. Okay, so if this is true, that means that A2, the reactant concentration in temperature 2, is going to be greater than the reactant concentration at equilibrium in T1. And the opposite will be true for these, uh, for the B concentrations. So we can write this, if you will. Um, I could say that A1 is equal to A2 minus X, and I could say that B1 is equal to B2 plus X, where X is the amount that's going to change um, once we make this temperature jump in the reaction. So now if I want to write down a rate law for this, I would, for example, look at the time derivative of the concentration of B which means that I could write this as the time derivative. And since I'm starting at B1, I'll take the time derivative of this. So it would be B2 plus X. B2 is a constant, so the time derivative of that is 0. So this would just be the same as dx dt. All right, so I'm going to get to a, 
hopefully a simple looking equation for that. Now I also know uh, just from looking at this reaction, the forward and the reverse cases, that I can write down this differential derivative of B with respect to T is simply the rate at which B is produced, which is K1 times A, minus the rate at which it is used up, which is K minus 1 times B. But now I have expressions for A1, uh, sorry, for A and for B, so I can just plug those in. A is going to be A1, which is A2 minus X, and B is going to be B1, which is B2 plus X. So when I put all these together, I'm going to end up with a net equation. This is dB dt, written as dx dt, and this is going to be dB dt as written as a2 minus x, oops, minus k minus 1 b2 plus x. Okay, so now when I pull the x's together in this, I will end up with uh, an expression that looks like k1a2 minus k minus 1, this is a b2, b2 minus k1 times x minus k minus 1 times x, so minus the sum of the two rate constants times x. Okay, but what is this thing here? Well, remember, when we have these things at equilibrium, these represent equilibrium values of the concentrations. So this ratio of B to A must be B2 to A2. And I can see that this is going to give me A2 times K1 is equal to K minus 1 times B2, which is just what I have here. So in other words, this whole thing in here is simply equal to 0. So I can forget this one. All I have is this left, and I shouldn't have crossed it out. Okay, so I get a very simple equation out of this that I need to solve, and that is that the derivative of x with respect to temperature is just equal to negative k1 plus k minus 1 times x. All right. And uh, this is one that we can solve fairly readily. Uh, I, I won't go through the details of this, but what we would get is that x as a function of temper uh, as a function of time would be b1 minus b2 e to the minus k1 plus k minus 1 times time. All right. Or I could also write this as b1 minus b2 e to the minus time over tau, where tau is now my relaxation time. Okay, so I'll uh, write that explicitly over here, that tau is equal to 1 over the sum of these two rate constants. All right, so what we've done here is we've provided a way that we're going to look at this as a function of time, so we'll be able to measure this tau value, this relaxation time value for this uh, experiment. And just as we said in the previous video, uh, we'll be able to also look at this uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, equilibrium, since the equilibrium constant is the ratio of the two constants. Um, we can write k1 plus k minus 1 is equal to 1 plus the equilibrium constant times k minus 1, and this is going to be equal to 1 over this relaxation constant. So when we solve this equation for k minus 1 and then plug it back in uh, to this to find k1, uh, we can actually solve for both of these constants. And let me go ahead and write down that result because it's, I guess, worth noting that k minus 1 then would be given by 1 over tau 1 plus the equilibrium constant. And k1 would be the equilibrium constant over tau of 1 plus the equilibrium constant. All right, so you can see when you add these two together, k1 plus k minus 1 will get 1 over tau, as we should. All right, so this represents actually a really powerful way of getting these two rate constants when we have a reaction that's extremely fast at achieving equilibrium. And for example, this is exactly the method that's used to determine the forward and reverse rate constants for the auto-ionization of water, which is a very quick equilibrium. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested in this, you, you can apply this method to a variety of different equilibria. I've chosen a particularly simple one so that we could uh, go into the details of it without getting overwhelmed by uh, too much extra stuff. But uh, this is a really powerful method and a really clever way of getting these rate constants.